Great, well thank you so much for the kind introduction and it's really a pleasure to be here this evening. Thanks everybody for coming to the last session. It takes a lot of fortitude, so we'll try to keep you entertained. Uh, and I'm pleased to have this chance to talk about strategies for managing cancer risks. So the goal for today is to present the cancer risks associated with BRCA mutations, to outline options for cancer risk reduction through surgery, screening, and medications, and subsequently to discuss strategies that people might use for decision making. So I know this audience is familiar with the high cancer risks associated with BRCA mutations. And this is actually from a paper that was also discussed this morning by Dr. Rebeck in the general session. It's a pooled analysis of studies of thousands of women with BRCA mutations. And it gives a pretty robust estimate of the cancer risks for the average woman with a BRCA mutation. We can see that for a woman with a BRCA1 mutation, lifetime risk of breast cancer has been estimated at 57%, ovarian at 40%. For BRCA2, breast estimated at 49%, and ovarian at 18%. And these are averages. In terms of other associated cancer risks, we do see increased risk of pancreatic, melanoma, and biliary cancers. The absolute risks are still small, generally under 5%, but they are elevated over the average. About a 20% lifetime risk of prostate cancer for men, and about a 6% lifetime risk of male breast cancer, higher with BRCA2 than with BRCA1. And for comparison, in the general US population, about 12% of women get breast cancer, 1.5% ovarian cancer, around 1% pancreatic cancer, 16% prostate cancer, and 0.1% male breast. So just reviewing where this stands in terms of average risks. So one question that comes up a lot is what happens to risks as women age? And this is a table from that same paper that I talked to you about, which I really like because the authors tried to figure out, well, if you get to a certain age and you haven't had cancer yet, what does your risk look like? And so it's a busy table, but if you focus, let's see if I can get the pointer, if you focus just on this gray bank of data here, for a woman with a BRCA1 mutation at age 20, we would estimate her risk to age 70 as being 54%. But if she gets to age 60 and hasn't had cancer yet, we would say her remaining lifetime risk would be more like 19%. So it's just a way of really displaying that women to some extent outlive some of their cancer risk as they age, and it's not as though all that risk just gets pushed in front of them. So what about the risks for breast cancer survivors? This has also been studied, and this is from a paper in 2009 in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. And I should note that, again, I'm showing all these curves where basically the y-axis shows the probability of something happening. Here it's the probability of getting a second breast cancer from 0 to 100%. And the x-axis is always time, as time passes. So in this study, they looked at the probability of getting this cancer for women as a function of the age at diagnosis. And they showed that for all women with the BRCA mutation who'd had a breast cancer, the chance of getting a second cancer in the other breast over 25 years was pretty high. It was 47%. And when you looked at BRCA1 versus BRCA2 mutation carriers, the BRCA1 mutation carriers had about a 1.6-fold greater chance of a contralateral second breast cancer. But we did see a relationship between age. So if the first cancer happened earlier, the risk of another one was higher. If the first cancer was under age 40, chance of getting a second one was 63% with the range as shown. Whereas if the first cancer was over age 50, the risk of a new one was much lower at around 20%. And this is just an illustration of what we know, which is that there is variation in cancer risk for women with BRCA mutations and men with BRCA mutations. And this is something that we really don't fully understand. And so you heard this morning in the general session from Dr. Rebeck about things we're learning about exposures and how they may affect cancer risks with a BRCA mutation. We heard about smoking, breastfeeding, and other things. There are also data on how other genes may interact with BRCA1 or 2 mutations to affect a person's cancer risk. And so a number of different studies have identified genes, some of them are listed here with different names, that interact with risk associated with BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations. 
what they look at is something called single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs, S-N-P, which basically means a small change in these genes. And the thing about these changes is they're pretty common. So maybe about 7% to 52% of the general population might have one of these changes. And they act as a risk multiplier for BRCA1 or 2 risk. So for example, if you were to have this change here, you would multiply the average risk by roughly 1.1 to get a sense of how risk might change. That's a simplified explanation, and again, we don't fully understand it, but it's a way to begin to understand the other genetic factors that may cause a person's risk to be different. And there was a big study last year that looked at different combinations of these other genes that might interact and made them into scores. They made them into three tertiles or three groups of low, moderate, and high. And what they found, again, was looking at breast cancer risk for a woman with a BRCA2 mutation. Here, this is one of those graphs that looks at the chance of remaining free of breast cancer. Women who had the lowest score for these other genes did a lot better at remaining cancer-free than the women who had worse combinations of these other genes. So again, just a way of saying that we're beginning to move toward personalized risk assessment. So another question that comes up a lot, at least in the clinical population that I see, is what does it mean when a patient tests negative for a known BRCA mutation in the family? So for example, if a woman has tested positive, she has a BRCA mutation, we then test her daughter for the same mutation and the daughter doesn't have it. What's the daughter's risk of getting breast cancer? Is it the same as the average person or is it higher? So there's been a lot of dispute about this in published papers in the literature. And there have been a few studies, um, generally fairly small, in clinic-based populations, high-risk populations, that have suggested that maybe when people test negative for their family's mutation, they might still have high breast cancer risk. We thought this was important to look at, so we studied it a few years ago in a large population from three countries, 3,000 families with BRCA mutations in the US, Australia, and Canada. And we actually found no evidence of a higher risk when patients test negative for the mutation in their family. So I think this was reassuring that a negative test does mean generally average risk. There's still some controversy in the literature, but I think it, for the average woman, it is good news. So moving into strategies to manage risk, well, certainly the most definitive strategy to manage breast cancer risk would be prophylactic mastectomy or preventive removal of both breasts before a cancer happens. Again, this is one of those figures that shows the probability of remaining breast cancer free over time. And you can see that women who had a bilateral prophylactic mastectomy were much more likely to be free of breast cancer than the women who didn't. And it's been estimated that this surgery reduces a woman's breast cancer risk by 90 to 95%. And not surprisingly, some studies have also estimated that there seems to be an improvement of survival when you do this. One thing that we don't know so much about is the difference in effectiveness between different types of mastectomy. So for example, a nipple sparing mastectomy versus a non-nipple sparing mastectomy. These things haven't been tremendously well studied. There are registries ongoing which will give us better data about this, and I think that will be helpful. The other surgery that is commonly used is prophylactic bilateral salpingo oophorectomy, or PO. And again, a graph that's flipped upside down here, the probability of developing ovarian cancer over time when women don't have an oophorectomy, obviously a high chance of getting ovarian cancer. When they do, the chance is much lower. And you heard Dr. Green speak about this this morning in the general session. There have been a recent uh, study from the group up in Toronto that shows that doing this surgery reduces your risk of getting ovarian cancer by as much as 80%, so really a big number, and seems to reduce the risk of death by 77%, so really a big benefit there. Notably, it also does reduce breast cancer risk in most studies by up to 50%, and that really seems to be age-dependent. So if women are doing this surgery around age 40 or so, we think it could reduce the breast cancer risk by half. If they do it around age 50, around the natural age of menopause, they probably get less of a risk reduction because we think it's probably about going into menopause early in terms of why it's beneficial. A lot of questions still about the optimal timing. Most guidelines still would say that it should be done by age 40. 
There have been some studies that have suggested maybe it should be 35, and so I would say 35 to 40 would be the guidelines at the moment, and still uncertainty about whether we can say different things for BRCA1 versus BRCA2. So what about breast cancer screening? Well, breast cancer screening is a reasonable alternative and a widely accepted one to prophylactic mastectomy for managing risk. It's actually more commonly used when you look at studies of BRCA mutation carriers overall. And so the thing about breast cancer screening is that it's basically been shown that mammography is not enough. And that's illustrated here in this uh, case study of a patient whom we saw at Stanford. She was a 38-year-old woman with a BRCA1 mutation, and she had a mammogram. And this figure here on the left shows her mammogram. Here's the outline of it. This mammogram was read as normal, but what you'll see here is that the breast tissue was very dense. That's something we see often with young women. And basically, there's a lot of white tissue here. What we want is for that tissue to be dark gray so that we could see a white tumor. You can imagine seeing a white breast cancer would be hard with all this white tissue there. And that's usually what young women's breasts look like on a mammogram. So instead, when we do the MRI, you can see the outline of the breast here on magnetic resonance imaging. It's much easier to see this white lesion in the middle, which prompted a biopsy. This turned out to be early cancer, which was found. It was treated with surgery, and the woman is doing great. So this is an observation that has been repeated many times in large studies of MRI in addition to mammogram. Mammograms in general have pretty low sensitivity in young women with BRCA mutations in most studies. Some studies have suggested that they've missed up to half of the cancers, whereas breast MRI has much higher sensitivity, most cancers being diagnosed in stage zero or stage one. Mammograms' ability to find things certainly varies by age. In some age groups, it works a lot better, particularly in older women, and probably to some extent by tumor type. So lots of uncertainty there still. But at the moment, the consensus is that both mammogram and MRI should be used in a screening program. So one thing we don't know is whether screening with mammogram and MRI actually can improve survival for a woman with a BRCA mutation. And one of the reasons that we don't know is there's never been a randomized trial where you flip a coin and half the group would get mammogram, half the group get mammogram and MRI. That really wouldn't be ethical to do at this point, given that we have so much observational data that MRI is a good thing. But so our group and others have been interested in trying to estimate whether there is likely to be a benefit from screening. And so together with my colleague Sylvia Plavritis at Stanford, I've done some work building a computer simulation model that takes the best data we can find and really runs sort of a virtual clinical trial looking at what we would expect in terms of these different strategies. So we published a few years ago a paper where we estimated that for a woman with a BRCA1 mutation, if she didn't do any sort of breast screening or surgery, average life expectancy might be about 71, whereas adding mammography screening might add on average about 0.7 years, and adding MRI might add about double that, about 1.2 years. These are just estimates, they're just averages, but it gives you a sense that we do think this screening likely does add benefit, and again, for some women, it will add a lot more benefit than that. So just an average and not a randomized trial, but gives you some sense of what it might be doing. And then there's ovarian cancer screening. So you heard a lovely talk about that this morning from Dr. Green. And I think, unfortunately, the bad news is that ultrasound plus CA125 as a strategy hasn't done much good in terms of reliable early detection at a stage when we can ensure better outcomes for patients. So that's been disappointing. But I think we did hear some good news this morning about the new ways of looking at this, the risk of ovarian cancer algorithm and other strategies that are coming down the pike. So this is an area that really needs a lot more work, but I think there is hope of making some progress here. So what about preventive medications? So this is an additional strategy that can be used. We usually think of it as something that people would use as an adjunct to screening if they're doing the best screening strategy but might want to try something to bring down their breast cancer risk further. The most commonly used drug is tamoxifen. Tamoxifen is a drug that basically blocks hormonal stimulation of the breast tissue. And it's also used as a treatment for breast cancer, has been for decades, so we know a lot about it. When women use it for five years as a preventive treatment, it does reduce breast cancer risk by about a third to a half, and that risk reduction seems to last at least 20 years in the studies that have been done. 
Most of the studies have been in women who do not have BRCA mutations, so I would emphasize that we don't know as much about its role in BRCA mutation carriers, though there was an observational study last year in the Journal of Clinical Oncology that did seem to show a benefit, so I think that is a reasonable option. There are some rare serious side effects, and that can be a deterrent. People do sometimes get blood clots or uterine cancer. These are actually really rare in comparison to the benefit that people get, but I think it's something that has to be weighed in terms of pros and cons. There are other drugs. One of them is raloxifene. That's a drug that's similar to tamoxifen. It was designed to have slightly lower side effects, so that's a good thing. But again, there's really very little information about how this one behaves among women with BRCA mutations, but certainly seems to be similar to tamoxifen in big trials and reasonable to consider it as an alternative to tamoxifen. The third is exemestane, an aromatase inhibitor that has a different mechanism of action. It's also a treatment for breast cancer. It only works in women who are postmenopausal. In premenopausal women, it doesn't work. But in a recent study, using it for about three to five years did significantly reduce the risk that a woman would get breast cancer. Again, little information among people with BRCA mutations, but our best estimate would be that it should be likely to work the same way. So how do we weigh the pros and cons of these different strategies for dealing with risk? Well, we know that surgery, in terms of the numbers, is the most effective way to reduce the cancer risk. Prophylactic mastectomy reduces breast cancer risk by 90 to 95%. Oophorectomy reduces breast cancer risk by about 50% if done around age 40, and reduces ovarian cancer risk by 80 to 85%. So those are the pros. I think the cons are that these surgeries are certainly invasive, they're irreversible, and they may affect body image and sexuality as well as fertility and can have other side effects. In terms of medications, we've seen that there is effective breast cancer risk reduction that's significant, a third to a half is a big deal, and that's particularly shown with tamoxifen. There is the concern about side effects. Those side effects are rare, but they have to be thought about when weighing this option. In terms of breast screening, if we look at the different options, mammogram is certainly the most studied screening test, just an x-ray of the breast, but that test does have uh, some benefits, even though it also has some, some negatives. Fewer false positives than, than MRI, in part because it's less sensitive. And it is better than MRI for finding some kinds of early stage zero breast cancer, the ductal carcinoma in situ. The big problems with mammogram include that it is a test that uses radiation, so we worry about radiation exposure, particularly in women under 30. That's been a concern. And of course, the problem with breast density in young women, harder to see things on the mammogram. We do have a new technology now called 3D tomosynthesis. It's sort of like doing a CAT scan of the breast, getting views that are more than just two sort of flat x-ray views. And that does seem to be really promising in terms of improving detection of breast cancers. So I think that's something that needs more study in women with BRCA mutations. Again, MRI is better at finding small cancers, high sensitivity, 80 to 90% in young high-risk women. However, it is quite expensive, and the price that we pay for this high sensitivity is that we do find more false positives, and thus there might be more of a chance of being called back to get a biopsy. So I think it's a challenging comparison because, as I was saying before, there's been no randomized clinical trial that says, all right, we'll flip a coin, half the group will have breast screening and half the group will have preventive mastectomy. I wouldn't want to join such a trial. It's just not a topic that you can treat that way because it's such a personal decision. And so I don't think we're ever going to have that kind of data, really, to make a choice between those two options. So we've tried to work on other ways that you might compare different strategies. And so our group, again, has used a computer simulation modeling approach to try to run our best shot at a virtual clinical trial of the different options you might choose. Again, this is one of these graphs that looks at probability of surviving by age, up to age 85, and it compares different strategies a woman might choose. So just for reference, this worst survival is for a woman with a BRCA1 mutation who did nothing at all to deal with the risks, no screening, no surgery. This curve up here on the top, the best survival is put there for reference. That's a woman who doesn't have a BRCA mutation. And so there are various ways one can move from this lower curve to the upper curve, preventive surgery and different steps. But one thing that we found from this work that was interesting was that 
The difference we estimated in survival when a woman did breast screening with mammogram and MRI as opposed to preventive mastectomy was fairly small. The difference was about 3 to 5 percent. So I think everybody might take that differently in terms of how she would think about it, but the difference was fairly small in part because with finding breast cancers early, we do estimate better outcomes from them. And this has been consistent with a recent observational study done in Europe that found similar numbers. So having developed this model to get some answers, we then wanted to make it available for patients and doctors to actually use in the clinic. And so a few years ago, we actually built a user interface that basically is just a way you can type things in and interact with the simulation model to try different things out. This is actually online at the moment at bracatool.stanford.edu. It's freely available. Anyone who likes to play with computer models like me, I'm very geeky, um, is welcome to take a look at it and uh, see what it shows. But so basically what it allows is for a person to put in her current age and her mutation status, BRCA1 or BRCA2, and to choose different options she might consider in terms of screening with mammogram or mammogram and MRI, prophylactic oophorectomy at various ages, or prophylactic mastectomy at various ages. And she can then compare these different strategies in terms of different outcomes. So for example, for each strategy, the model would say, for example, by age 70, a certain number of women have died from other causes, a certain number from ovarian or breast cancer, a certain number are alive having survived breast cancer, and then a certain number are alive and never had cancer. So it allows people to compare different strategies that they might think about on a number of different dimensions. And we were actually interested in knowing whether a tool like this or other similar tools might do any good. So actually three years ago, we came and tested it out here at this meeting. And I just want to thank everybody. As usual, Force was wonderful in being willing to help us with research. And so we had people test it. We had 40 previvors, women with BRCA mutations who'd not developed cancer. We also had 15 to 20 doctors just to get a sense of how the other side felt about it. And we asked a number of questions about usefulness, about the graphics, about whether this tool might be able to improve patient-doctor encounters. And we asked people to grade it on a scale of one being bad to five being best. And in general, people seem to gain some benefit from it high fours in terms of a scale of one to five. So I think tools like this can occasionally be helpful in allowing people to look at their choices and prioritize them, and can be one of the ways that people begin to put it all together to make decisions. So I will stop there and just provide contact information for our group at Stanford, and I'm going to let Dr. Hurley continue. Thank you. <laughs> So again, um, thanks so much for being here, and I really, and I think it's a testament to the importance of this topic that there are so many of you here so late in the um, so late in the program. Um, and uh, if you were at the lunch, I think this was the Hey Ma talk. Um, so um, at this point, you've probably uh, gotten the picture of just how many different decisions there are to make, and that this can be uh, burdensome when you take on the decision to know uh, your risk. Some people will describe it as almost like a decision avalanche, that there are so many different uh, things to decide. And it's not always easy to predict which decision is going to be the one that really gets you hung up. Um, the, um, you know, the big and most dramatic ones are the uh, risk-reducing surgery decisions for mastectomy and oophorectomy. Um, but there are other ones that are challenging, whether to get tested or not, is sometimes uh, a, you know a, a psychologically challenging, or uh, you know for um, a couple, uh, you know if they're deciding about pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. So what I'm going to be talking about uh, applies to decisions across the range of what you might be making in terms of managing risk, and it does apply to both women and men. So there it is, the avalanche. People may, may not be realize what they are taking on when they decide to get testing. So that's one of the reasons that informed consent is important and genetic counseling is important uh, when you decide to get genetically tested so that you're, you're ready for the task that is ahead. Um, now we know that um, the, you've encountered how much technical their information there is to master in terms of making decisions. Um, and the other thing that's challenging is the decisions that you're making 
directly and indirectly affect uh, your relatives, whether it's, um, you know, once you learn your risk, other people start learning that they're at risk as well, or um, people having feelings about the decisions that you're making. So um, uh, what we talk about in terms, you've, we've, you've heard the, the, uh, the term informed decision at this point, and so that includes knowing what the risks and benefits, limits and alternatives to um, the procedure or, or decision that you're facing. And it requires a commitment both by you and the person that you are working with to this process of being informed to the level um, that will facilitate you making a good decision. Um, I like to say that the, the, the decision process encompasses multiple levels. Um, the cognitive level, collecting the relevant facts and understanding them, um, is, uh, has been addressed quite a bit at this conference and that you've been getting a lot of uh, the, the uh, best and most recent information to support. And uh, the decision tool that, um, that uh, you were talking about what, um, is part of um, helping people um, process uh, this complex technical information. But there are additional levels. There's the emotional level of dealing with the feelings stimulated by the decision. What does it feel like to have to make the decision? People have feelings about that. And then thinking about how this decision fits into other parts of your life. And then even after all that, there is a third level, the action level, which is once you've made your decision, having the confidence that you um, have the appropriate coping strategies and you have the support you need to put your plan into action. So I think it's important to um, acknowledge that not everyone follows the same path in uh, BRCA. We know, you know, we just heard that there, the difference um, in uh, between um, uh, mastectomy versus uh, screening over the course of a lifetime, in, especially in people who've had prophylactic oophorectomy, is relatively small. And you might get the impression, being here sometimes, that everybody gets. Um, uh, uh, both surgeries, and um, that's not exactly true. Um, if we look at the uh, research literature, I know uh, some of these data might be out of date. I think that the rates are going up a little bit, but if you look at um, uh, women who um, have, uh, who are, do not currently have a cancer diagnosis, in that first year, only about 20 percent are choosing to have a mastectomy at that point, a bilateral mastectomy, and even when you do uh, the testing in the context of a cancer diagnosis when the fear is really high, you still have women who are choosing not to have the bilateral mastectomy even then. So, um, uh, it, so it's important to acknowledge that the balance of the benefits and drawbacks, those pros and cons, is going to a are going to add up differently for each person. And so it's, uh, it's impossible to say what's going to be right for a given person. Okay, so some s things about um, decision making and the psychology of it is that there, uh, especially for a complex decision, there's going to be a period of time when you're not sure yet what you're going to do, and we don't like to be uncertain. It's frustrating. It's uncomfortable. It do it's not an empowered feeling to be uh, still um, in an indecisive place. So you need to be able to hang out in that discomfort of not knowing until you've um, been able to fully explore um, your options. Sometimes people will hear a little bit of information and say, okay, that's it, that's what I'm going to do, and, sort of, and skip um, this, this larger exploration because that uncertainty is uncomfortable. So it does require a certain level of trust that um, if you hang out long enough that the decision will come. It's, uh, it's a little bit like stirring a pot over and over and you're waiting for the sauce to thicken, you think this is just not going to work, it's not going to work, and then all of a sudden it changes over. And I have seen this process happen often enough that it's unmistakable when it happens. And if someone is committed to the process, it does happen, but it might feel like to you, you know, I, you know, I, I, I can't imagine getting unstuck. But I can promise you it does uh, come into place. Um, it also, it's important, uh, you know, sometimes you'll see people, um, 
you know, feeling like, you know, you know uh, expressing gratitude that we have these choices. But if you step back, no one would want to have to make these choices if, if they could. And, you know, it does show the limits of our current knowledge. You know, hopefully 200 years from now or 50 years from now or 20 years from now, having preventive surgery is going to look as primitive as using leeches to treat disease looks to us, okay? Um, and, but it's unfortunate that we can't fast forward into the future. We are in the here and now where this is what we have to offer. And, you know, it's not easy to accept that. Um, you also, um, time does funny things when you're trying to make a decision. If you're feeling anxious about your decision, one way that manifests uh, is, um, is that you feel like there's no time. You have to do it right now. The clock is ticking. That time bomb is ticking. So uh, sometimes what that means is that um, if you're really preoccupied with you know, getting this over with, it might mean that maybe that um, you're afraid of that emotional level of going in deep enough to the feelings to sort out uh, what you want to do. So, um, you know, it's a little, it's sometimes a little bit of a warning flag when someone comes in and says, okay, gotta, gotta do it. I remember one of the most powerful therapy sessions I had was with a woman who had all the facts really straight and she was being very decisive and she said, I gotta get this done. And I said to her um, uh, a phrase, don't just do something, sit there. And she burst into tears. And we wound up having to, you know, doing an exploration over time uh, that un uh, where a, a lot of uh, emotions uh, that were packed down came out around her diagnosis. Does this picture look familiar to anybody? <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, that the, the people have a vary in terms of their preferences about uh, seeking out information. Um, it, it is good to be empowered. There's a lot of good information out there on the web, especially. Um, but uh, it's important to practice good, um, for lack of a better word, information hygiene. Okay, <laughs> which means, uh, which means because recognizing that if you're spending a lot of time being exposed to the information, that could potentially send your anxiety up and up. So what I recommend to people is, uh, if you're going to go online and do searches, is to have a specific question in mind and uh, spend a limited amount of time looking for that and then stop. Doing endless searching, you know, daisy chaining from one thing to the next can actually increase distress. Um, another thing that's really important to, uh, this is something we know from psychosocial literature, that, um, that stressors tend to uh, pile up. And so ev if you have other stressors going on, even if they're not directly related to the genetic testing or the cancer, they can influence how you feel about it. And, and, and this can happen regardless of the time sequence. So someone who had a trauma even 10 years ago uh, in the cancer, in the context of you know now making decisions about genetic risk, that that sense of trauma kind of uh, you know, that it multiplies. Um, or if something else happens while you're in the middle of this, like say your spouse is getting laid off while you're in the middle of trying to make decisions, you know that can also up the um, the stress level and and make the decision feel harder. Um, a really important point is that when you're making a big decision, especially something like a risk-reducing surgery, PGD, something like that, is it requires that you know what your own priorities are and how you're feeling. And um, that process of turning inward is not always easy or comfortable. And uh, certain people uh, may be uh, particularly prone to be not in the habit of checking in with themselves. So people who are socialized to focus on others and put themselves uh, second. So um, uh, mothers, uh, people who are in helping professions like uh, nursing, um, and also um, people who were in the situation early on um, who maybe lost a parent or had a parent who was ill or incapacitated for different reasons during childhood and became that little adult focusing on the needs of the parent or of other siblings, um, 
have, uh, can have trouble turning the focus back on, on themselves. Um, you, they may not know what they want in that situation. So that's where um, support becomes really important. Okay. So as I mentioned, one of the things that complicates the decision making is that um, it's, it, you're walking an individual path, but what you're doing definitely affects others and it manifests in different ways. So in terms of uh, couples, um, each you know, uh, person has ownership, if you will, of their own body, but in a couple, the, cup, the you know, coupleness is manifested in, in sharing your physical experience uh, through sexuality, through touch, through um, uh, uh, joint planning about um, uh, childbearing. Uh, so uh, for the person who uh, is not directly making the risk management decisions, for the other uh, person, there can be a feeling of helplessness, not wanting their partner to suffer and not being able to do anything to relieve it. Um, and, this, and this, again, can go um, both ways, right? Um, I was recently um, uh, working with, um, and, uh, and I used a stock photo to just kind of put that human touch. But um, in this, uh, you know, I was also re uh, working with a, um, a lesbian couple uh, who were um, working through, um, uh, it was the, one of them had uh, Lynch syndrome and she was working through whether to have a, a major colon surgery. And, and the issues that came up were very much the same. So I think it's really important to um, acknowledge the varieties of uh, families and couples who are in this position of supporting each other through decision making. Um, so this is a very familiar scenario that I wind up uh, seeing in, in clinic is you'll get one person saying, uh, you know, t and typically this arises over the mastectomy decision in a heterosexual couple where the woman says, honey, will you still love me if I don't have my breasts? And for the man, there's only one answer. It's like a gun to the head. <laughs> of course, honey, I'll love you, right? So there's no latitude or, or there's a perception that there's no latitude for any other response. Now the problem with that is because she knows that, that uh, he knows that that's the right thing to say is that it doesn't go in, it doesn't have the reassuring effect that was intended. So, um, so what I try to do then is to um, encourage, um, to, to, to let the partner know that it is okay to, um, to express feelings about the decision and that that does not undermine the support, it actually enriches the support. So being able to say, you know, um, I really like your body the way it is, I like the way your breasts feel, I'm sad that we're going to have to go through this, but I really love you and I want you to be around for a really long time and if this is what you want to do. And you can hear the difference in that and how much more reassuring that would be. Um, by the way, does anybody recognize that term, mensch, uh, you know, from New York? Yeah, it means good guy. So, you know, so I call this like the mensch test, the good guy test. Um, and again, you know, this is going to apply to any, you know, couples of any combination of gender. But um, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a real one and some of the most moving moments I've had sitting with people is when I uh, see a couple and you see them talking to each other, maybe the, for the first time at a different level about uh, the decision. Um, another thing to remember is that physicians are people too and um, they also have feelings about what is going on. Physicians are motivated um, to save lives. They've gone into their profession for a reason and so um, uh, and, and their recommendation, their influence in the room is very powerful. So sometimes um, people will feel um, pushed or intimidated if they are leaning in a direction, especially when it's around the mastectomy decision which has more latitude in it uh, 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 to, um, to, expre to express a strong, the physician will express a strong opinion and the person feels that, that, that they don't have room to consider it for themselves. We do know from research that people who make a decision and or who carry out a decision just because the doctor told them to 
uh, without um, sort of making it their own in some way, without incorporating it or owning it, are somewhat more likely to experience regret later. So that's why this decision uh, process is really important. Okay. Um, I can't say enough about the importance of social support. Um, and, you know, a, a, a peculiarity, if you will, of, um, of BRCA is that the people who are your closest supports, your go-to people, may be making the same decisions at the same time or may be um, or, or having strong feelings about what you're going through. So it's an important to identify at least one person who can be neutral, who can listen without judging, who can listen without putting their anxiety into the situation to give you some of that free space to um, consider what you're doing. Um, a really smart way to use social support, is if, especially if you're going for an important appointment, is to have someone that you can touch base with either before or after, if they're not gonna be actually in the appointment with you, but to, um, in, uh, they use this in 12 step, they call it bookending uh, important experiences with social support. We do know that people who do not have at least one person to confide in are at risk for distress in the long run. Now sometimes people will have big networks of friends, but they're afraid to upset or bother people, so they may have the support available, but they don't use it, and they wind up feeling very kind of distressed and alone in the midst of this uh, crowd for that reason. Okay. Sure. No, it could be. It could be. It's more someone who has that quality where you feel like you're, they're, they're going to listen to you, right, and not put their, uh, you know, put their opinion in. Yeah, thanks for the clarification. So uh, if you heard me this, this afternoon, um, there is yet a deeper layer to decision making that, uh, you know, t uh, can account for um, what makes these uh, uh, even more difficult than would meet the <coughs> eye. Um, oh, let's go this way. And that is the concept of limitation. These decisions, especially the surgery decisions, they're one way. Once you make it, you can't take it back. You can say, oh, you know what, mastectomy, that was a bad idea for me. Let me get the breasts back. We can't do that. So there's something about that irreversibility that is a shadow of the ultimate irreversibility of our lives. Our lives also go in one direction, and sooner or later, we all do pass on. Um, and so the irony is that we're doing uh, this, uh, we're making these big decisions to have long and full lives, to, you know, to survive and thrive as long as possible, but the very, by the very token of the fact that you're leaping into the unknown and you're doing something you can't reverse has an unconscious echo with that thing that we are the most afraid of, right? So sometimes people will feel hesitant about making the decision, not because they don't know what they want to do, but because that nameless dread of what we're trying to avoid has cast a shadow over the proceedings. Um, it also sort of uh, uh, underscores the responsibility that we do have for our lives. That's just our human condition, uh, that each of us is ultimately responsible for our own actions. And there's an aloneness that goes with that, even when you're with other people. So for someone who's already struggling with a sense of aloneness, either feeling isolated, uh, sometimes people feel like, I feel like a freak because I have this uh, status, I'm different from everyone else, or someone who's in grief, someone who's depressed, taking on the, uh, the existential isolation of making a big decision uh, is, uh, exacerbates the pain of aloneness that they're already in. So these are people who need some extra support. Um, there are lots of different reasons that, um, that risk triggers isolation. Um, the fact, you know, have you had this experience when you're trying to talk to a friend and explain the choices? It sounds like science fiction to them. You said they're going to do what? They're going to move this here? They can do that, right? And so that creates a little bit of distance. The choices just seem drastic. You probably had people react to you, like how could you possibly consider that? 
you start talking in alphabet soup. You know, think about all the different word. You know, like BRCA, um, PAR, PGD. You know, ABC, right? So it, it, you have to. You know, it's almost like you've entered another land of jargon, that, in trying to translate that back into your world. Now, another thing that happens, especially as more and more um, people are getting tested at younger ages, is it puts decisions on the table that make you different from your peers. So for you know, women, say, in their 20s who are thinking about starting a family, uh, but, or, you know, or you know, for um, you know, both, really, if you're thinking about doing, uh, getting pregnant but doing PGD to avoid uh, passing on a mutation, um, you know, that, that's, that's different from all the other, you know, 20-somethings uh, who are just popping their babies out without having to do any kind of intervention, who aren't feeling the pressure to hurry up and have their babies, things like that. So it kind of puts you out of step with your peers. Uh, for women who uh, go ahead and uh, pursue prophylactic oophorectomy and who are going into um, an, a, a menopause, uh, a decade or, or more before others will feel old relative to their peers, even though that's not literally true, it's, it, it starts to feel emotionally true. And just the fact that we're talking about things like cancer, we're talking about re, you know, increased survival and things like that, that's putting mortality on the table far sooner than you would naturally talk about it. It's normal for someone in their 80s to be contemplating their lives and contemplating mortality that's that's age appropriate it's not as you know it doesn't have that same quality at the age of 25 35 40 right. so uh, sometimes people will respond to um, the, you know the, the gravity of the decision by trying to give it away giving it back to um, uh, to the physician or just hoping that someone will come along and make this better um, so, uh, and, it's, and again, if someone has, uh, you know, been bereaved at a very early age and is you know, still carrying around that very young child, there's, there's that longing for someone to come along and take care, right? And so this, again, it's a powerful feeling and it seems to come out of nowhere um, if you don't know how to name it and, 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 and claim it. Uh, sometimes what happens is that once you sort of take on that, uh, that sense of responsibility to make a decision, you might start to become aware of the fact that you've been making lots of other important decisions all along but didn't really know that or claim it. Uh, so for example, um, I had a patient once who um, uh, you know, was making her uh, mastectomy decision and uh, her, her and her husband disagreed about it and uh, he wound up leaving uh, within a couple of months after she recovered. And, um, and at first she came in and she was very angry, how awful, he is not a mensch, you know, he's, <laughs> he's, you know, he's an awful person. But then she started, I started asking her about the marriage and, she's, and she reflected, well, she had picked him because he was tall, Ivy educated, he was a lawyer, good provider, pleased her mother. And she realized that she had never really been in love with him. She'd picked someone who filled the role. And so as she started taking more responsibility for that decision, that helped her move forward in terms of uh, having a, a better sense of her body image. And then she wound up you know, going out and dating and meeting men who she could talk to, she had more natural uh, rapport with. And uh, so it really, um, it shifted not just um, her adjustment to the decision, but it had a ripple effect in her life as she claimed more of her own power. So as you can see, what will happen sometimes is that making a big decision, if there are fault lines in a relationship, um, then those get uh, brought out into the open. So sometimes when people say, well, this caused my relationship to break up, there was a weakness there that has now been exposed. Or sometimes people will have coping strategies that work pretty well in most circumstances, like, say, keeping busy and distracted. As long as you can stay busy and distracted, that's good. But if you're contemplating being, you know, having a recovery of several weeks, you're not going to be able to keep busy. People get afraid of that. Um, 
and, uh, and, and so it can expose the limitations of your favorite coping strategies. Um, also, what can happen is that if you're making your decision and once you've started to claim that power, other people who have not yet become aware of this existential fact of life may feel afraid and may start taking um, distance. And so there becomes the, almost this, this, this gap between people who've had to step forward in life in some way, whether it's you know from BRCA or any other of the thousand things that happen to us in life that get us to reflect, to um, take responsibility, to experience the limitations of life. So, um, uh, so people, you, you may find that some friends can handle it and some can't, and you can't always predict who that's going to be. Um, and then um, in uh, sometimes, and it doesn't happen often, but it's often, it, it's very happy when it does happen, is that people come in who have had uh, uh, childhood experiences that really have squelched their development in some way. And usually this is either someone who's been exposed to uh, abuse, um, either direct physical, verbal, uh, sexual abuse, or if there's been a lot of substance abuse in the home, um, so that the, the the, uh, that turning within reveals a, a very painful emptiness um, inside. Um, I had um, a patient once who came in who um, was having uh, terrible body image um, issues after her um, uh, bilateral mastectomy. She had rushed into it. She just said, just get it off. I don't want to think about it. Um, and this was in the context of a diagnosis. And she and I asked her a little more about well, how did you cope with you know going through treatment? And she said, I just let them do what they wanted to do to my body, and I just let my mind float away. And I got this little chill, and I said, okay, you know, that's kind of like when you know a, a child who's being sexually abused and feels helpless. You know, that's a coping strategy that they use. And she said, well, that is what happened to me. And she had never talked about the fact that a family friend had been abusing her from the age of like 13 to 17. So, um, so this uh, came to the as this came to the surface, we realized that working through this was an integral part of helping her work through her cancer experience. They were completely intertwined. Now, this this is pretty heavy going, right? You know, so when someone walks in, you know, I never really know how deep uh, the issues are going to go. Um, but I do see people coming out at the other end with a healthy sense of resolution. So, and the antidote for this heaviness, this existential weight, is meaning, is that is um, uh, knowing uh, what this decision is going to do for you. Um, what are your big goals in life? What connects you to other people? What gives you a sense of purpose? Getting the decision to align with that so that you, um, when uh, I know that someone is ready, they can say in a sentence what the surgery or whatever the decision is, is going to do for them. And when you can say that something that's it's for you, it's not something happening to you, that gives the strength to move forward. It's a critical linguistic difference reflecting uh, a, an inner reality. So what I look for uh, when, I, when I see that some, when I can say that someone's ready, they're knowledgeable, they're informed, but they're not overloaded or overwhelmed. Their, their expectations are realistic about what's going to happen. Their goals are clear and they have adequate support to move from the decision level to the action level. The red flags, uh, by contrast, when somebody comes in and says, just tell me what to do, they're overloaded with information, they keep going back to the numbers, okay, this doctor told me 15% and this doctor told me 18%, um, you know, as a defense against moving to that emotional or that action level. Um, if someone's either overwhelmed with emotion or very shut down with emotion, and they don't have anybody to confide in. These are, the th these are the times when I tell people, if possible, if it's medically safe, we're not in the context of a diagnosis, if you can, let's slow down a little. There's, there's, there are things 
we want to put in place to make this come out psychologically well for you as well as physically. So uh, what I want to leave you with is that how someone decides is as important as what they decide. So the, your process carries forward into uh, the recovery process, into coping with any complications that come up, into leading to that next decision. When you, make, when you go through a good decision process that reduces the risk of having regret later on, it, it is normal, like once you've made your decision and you're moving into the action phase, to, to be anxious. It's almost like stage fright. You know, that plunge into the unknown just is scary. And it doesn't undo the decision. It doesn't mean that you're making the wrong decision if the night before a surgery you're feeling scared. That's, that's just human, right? Um, but the imp an important thing is, too, is, is you see the potential for the ripple effect of, that, of a good decision process into other areas of your life. It can be a source of growth. So for example, if we go back to the, the woman uh, that I told you about who came in and said, all right, we're going to get this done. And I said, don't just do something, sit there. So we spent some time in therapy. And because she wasn't in the context of a diagnosis, we could take our time and really explore the issues. And when she did finally come to a decision, she had learned quite a bit about herself. And you have to picture her. She was um, very well coiffed, never a hair out of place, perfect makeup. And um, uh, she came in and she announced, I'm going on a safari to Africa. And I'm going to be in a tent with, and with other people. And I'm going to go do this. And she said, all my friends are laughing at me. They can't picture me without a hair dryer. But I learned through, that if I can make this decision, I can do anything. Okay, so that's the thought I would like to leave you with, and then we can open this for questions. Thank you so much.